my parents are originally from Pennsylvania. My dad grew up, um, you know, my dad grew up poor. He was, uh, um, he had six younger sisters. He was the oldest, um, and they were. My dad had a job building smokestacks when we were kids. We traveled around and I think it was hard on my mom. You know, it was, it, it's hard on any family, especially my oldest sisters. They kept getting bounced around. They would make friends and then they'd go to another school. You know, he would do a job, be there for six, seven months, and then he would move on to the next job. The company would take him around. So I was in, um, when I start remembering my childhood, I start to remember Texas. You know, you know when you're like two and three and you kind of just phase out, you don't really have those memories just a little bit. But um, when we lived in Texas, I started to remember it. I, I played outside more uh, by myself. We had some friends in this um, trailer park that we lived in. And anyway, it was Christmas time and my, my mother um, had these decorations. They were like little puppets you would slide over, bottles I mean. And she showed it to me and she said, hey Carrie, later on we'll, we'll go uh, check the dumpster and we'll get these bottles out and um, we can put these puppets over for Christmas time. So we went to this, this dumpster and I figured we'll just get them now. And the dumpster was about 400 pounds and it was on this, this concrete platform but it was on a slant. And I remember just uh, reaching onto it and I remember it starting to tip. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I don't remember much after that. You know, I remember being in a hospital room a little bit. You know, I went into cardiac arrest four or five times, they said, and, and I had to be resuscitated. And So the dumpster had tipped and, and fell over on me. And in the process, it had put a rib through my lung and filled up one of my lungs with blood. It had split my liver in two. I was in the hospital for, for, like I said, four to six months. I can't remember exactly when, because the hope was that my liver would, the, the two pieces that would split would touch. And if they touched, then maybe it would start to grow back together again. And so I had to be completely still. And you're talking about a five-year-old kid that's got a lot of energy. My liver touched, the two pieces started to uh, grow together. Um, and then I was fine and I was able to get out. I think my dad had already moved to a, a job in Minnesota, so then when I was ready to be out of the hospital, they came, he came and got us and then we went up to Minnesota and, and then from Minnesota, I eventually went back to Pennsylvania where my parents grew up. And uh, we were home at that point. And then that's where it kind of took off with the wrestling. Representing Pennsylvania, Gary Kolos. Nobody in my family that, that wrestled directly. Um, my dad didn't wrestle, my uncles didn't wrestle, it wasn't, wasn't anything like that, but my cousins started. I had a lot of energy and it was something that my mom was like, we gotta do something with this kid. And so I went to wrestling practice. And wrestling practice in, in Pennsylvania was five days a week. I mean, you started, I, all I ever knew was Monday through Friday and then you wrestled on Saturday. I found out who Gable was, he was a world champion, he was Olympic champion. I kind of found out exactly what the Olympic games were. And you know, I decided at that point that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a junior Olympic champion. That turned in from wanting to win it to you know wanting to be the youngest guy ever to do it at the time. I wanted to be an NCAA champion four times and undefeated. I mean, I just wanted to just win all the time, and I wanted to be the best wrestler ever to ever wrestle, and um, and that's what drove me. The outstanding wrestler. Came in with a 33-0 record and leaves undefeated. He's from Pennsylvania, Mr. Gary Polak. My dad came to me and he said, hey, there's, there's this other kind of wrestling called freestyle. They do it in the summer. And uh, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, I'll try it. I remember grabbing a guy in a front headlock, and that's when it was a 15-point tech, and rolling him across the mat, and they said, okay, you win, 15 nothing." and I said, well, that was pretty cool, and then I got in the finals with some tall guy, and like any kid in his second year, I threw a headlock, I, I pinned him, and I was a national champion, and it was freestyle, and freestyle changed me, and, and that second year of wrestling changed me, and at that point is when um, um, I, I started to write down the, my, my goals, and I started going.
So we'll try to dig in here. I know it's in the back, but it's a little dark and, and a little uh, crazy in here. Let me move some stuff. There you have it. It's, uh, this is all the stuff that, that has kind of traveled with me. And then um, my mom's probably, I mean, you know, every mother keeps their, their kids' stuff. And um, that is just a singlet. I can't say this was, I think that was in the Olympics. This was when I was with Sunkist and, you know, we went my two NCA plaques. Hat, warm up, uh, Bobby Douglas book. These are one of the first things I learned out of when my dad was teaching me. So when it, VHS was just coming in, so you have these pictures. This was probably the worst creation ever made for me because you see you have this picture one through six, one through eight, yeah, one through six, I mean. And because it wasn't VHS, my dad would look at each picture and I would have to try to duplicate it. So it was the worst on me. He's like, nah, you didn't really look like picture five. You know, the guy's feet and I would have to redo it and redo it. So, you know, man, I haven't been through this thing in a long time. You can smell it through mothballs. My dad um, started to help me after my second year. When I wrote down my goals, I always tell people sometimes that was the biggest mistake I could have done um, because he got his hands on it and he sat me down and we had this long conversation. And I was seven turning eight. And I might have been looking at him and he said, so this is really what you want to do? And I said, yeah. What eight-year-old is going to say anything different? He says to me, look, if this is really what you want to do, I will help you do it. But once we start, you can't quit. And uh, I said, well, yeah, this is what I, I, I really wanted to do. Now, had he told me the training methods before we started, I would have said, no, I don't want to do this. You're trying to make weight. <laughs> in a plastic suit and all wrapped up. You know, everybody's heard that, fr uh, that, that saying, well, you know, how fast will you move? Well, if I run in here with a gun, you'll move. You know, that's that old saying people say, you know, if I had a gun, you'd do this. I always tell you the easy way to sum up my father is, my dad would bring the gun. The outstanding wrestler of the Freestyle World Championships, as selected by the officials, the 55 kilo champion from USA, Terry Collot. He wanted to see me succeed so bad that he, he even knew that there was times, you know what, I went too far. Um, but it, he, you know, he would, you know, occasionally say, hey, I'm sorry. We shouldn't have done it that way last night. There is definitely times when you're like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? The example was that everybody gets a sticky point or a plateau in their career. And I got plateaued on the bottom. I had been ridden in the practice room for so long that it was starting to come out into the, the, the matches. And my dad was absolutely frustrated. We worked on these different techniques, these stand-ups, and, and, um, and my dad was a great coach, don't get me wrong. And he knew some technique, but he never wrestled, he learned it. But sometimes he had some stuff that was off the wall. He just believed it would work, but he didn't wrestle either. And he had this, this, this stand-up that I, to this day, it was this stupid stand-up that didn't work. And one day he brings in this pole, and I don't know what it is, and he says, hey, Carrie, put your hand on this thing. Let me film it Shut in. Myself. Let him... No, Come on. no, no, because you ain't gonna give it to him. I, ain't... I got a cord. Come on. <laughs> I can't wait to film this And so I, I put my hand on it, and when I put my hand on it, my whole hand just crinkled up, and I felt this intense pain. <laughs> And I like jumped back and my eyes teared up and it was an electric cattle prod for they, they used to move cattle. But he said, now listen, um, I've had enough of watching you get ridden. It's all mental focus. It's all about going berserk on the bottom. You know the technique, now get out. And if you don't get out, I'm gonna shock you again. And after about two hits, 
in that practice and the tears flowing, nobody could hold me down again. I think in that one night, I might have taken six or seven hits. And like I said, my dad, he had his methods, but I left that practice room as mad as I was at him. And as many tears as I shed, I walked that practice room saying, man, when your mind's right, you can do anything. And, and I, you, you couldn't hold me on my back, can't do anything at that point. We would warm up with 500 push-ups straight. You couldn't take a break. Then you would do 500 sit-ups. Then we'd run around the room. And then we would drill some technique for a little bit. And then practice was like an hour live. And at the end of practice, he would say, okay, we're gonna do 20, 20 takedowns. And for every takedown you lose, it's 100 push-ups that you gotta do when you go home. The push-ups started to mount. When I would hit 800, 900, and hit 1,000, then the tears would start coming. And then my dad would blow his stack and I couldn't cry. And then he'd say, that's it. You're doing all, 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 tw all two, uh, 2,000 push-ups, Carrie. We're going home. So we go home one night, and the deal was I have to do 100. He's watching TV. I got to do them you know, in the living room. I do 100 push-ups. I make a little line on a piece of paper, shake my arms out, and do another 100. I can't take more than 30 seconds of break. And if I started crying, well, one night, they just got piled on because I couldn't stop crying. And he was always trying to tell me I was capable of anything and mentally tough and I had to be strong. And so I might have been crying at 1,500 and, and then he piled on. By the, the, by the time the evening was over, it was 10,000 push-ups in about three and a half hours. At 3,500, you just go numb. At 6,000, you're just bored and you want to get it done. And then you get faster in the last 2,000. You know, my dad caught a lot of heat when we were, we were younger because people thought my father was crazy on how he trained me. And it was always, oh, that poor kid, he's going to get burned out. But what people don't realize, if you were across the gym and you saw my dad and he had his finger in my face, you might be sitting there saying that poor kid, but what you didn't realize is my dad was over there saying, you're too good to beat that guy by 14 points instead of beating him by 15 points. You know, you, you could have gotten that extra takedown. So it was never, um, he was never tearing me down. I was constantly being built up. I was constantly being built up and I believed that I was capable of anything on the mat. And there was, you know, I might have had tears and he might've been tearing into me a little bit, but he was teaching me how to, how to perfect this sport. And, um, and I learned it and I got it and I understood it. You know, if it, if it wasn't him and, he, and I wasn't the right kind of kid, it would have never worked, you know? But it worked because I loved it and I wanted to be perfect at it. From USA, Kerry Pola. He was about becoming a, a master of the sport. He wasn't about winning. He never put winning into my mind. He was about me becoming a great wrestler. I was the youngest junior Olympic winner in history when I was eight. And then, um, and then I, I won it seven times. The most anybody had ever won it was five. And when I won it seven, everybody was waiting for me to get to high school and see if I could continue to going. And, and there was a lot of people wanting to see if I would burn out. And, um, and so at that point is when people really started to notice the things that I was doing. You know, winning little kids state championships, big deal, you know? Um, Pennsylvania State's, is, it's, it's a lot of culture, man. There's a lot of tradition. So now my freshman year, my dad felt like I should be at 112 pounds. So my father would, would wake me up at five o'clock in the morning to go and work out before school. And then I would go to school and then I would go to team practice. And then I might work out again at home. It was, it was crazy. It was just uh, ridiculous. I was, I was getting fried. Jefferson 
And I knew why he was doing it. He just was, now the pressure was on. He was feeling the pressure. Like, he wanted to see me succeed. He wanted to see me go undefeated and win that state title. He wanted to see me at 112. He thought that was my best chance. And I just told him, look, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. You know, you can't do it anymore. You know, you can't, you, you don't know as much wrestling as I do. You've taught me everything you can teach me in terms of being tough and having a foundation and how to master the sport. Like, you can't do it anymore. If I'm going to do it, it's up to me. I realized entering high school, um, a lot of people get really think that's a huge accomplishment in Pennsylvania, you know, going undefeated. And, and it was, it is, and I don't mean to knock it, but I set out to do it. You got freestyle Again, I was back to perfection. I was trying to pin everybody. I wanted to win four titles and win four outstanding wrestlers and have four pins in the finals. It was just how I was wired. My freshman and sophomore years in high school were, um, they were competitive. It was hard, like those were competitive years. I could get up for matches. My junior year was just like, you know, man, I got two more years of this. I was ready to move on. See, Carrie's trying to be easy with it. So it was, it was pretty dominant, lopsided my way all the way through. I had pinned everybody in the state finals up until my senior year. People always ask me why I was so upset because I was, you know, I had pinned everybody. Again, I was back to perfection. I was trying to pin everybody. I wanted to win four titles and win four outstanding wrestlers and have four pins in the finals. My senior year, the, the, the phone started to ring and the, the letters started to come in. And Here's the light at the end of the tunnel, man. I'm ready to get out of here and get going with the next phase of my career. When I entered college, my, um, my expectations of how I was going to perform um, were the same as when they were in high school. I mean, my plan was to go undefeated and win four NCAA titles because I wanted to pan and tech everybody. Um, didn't play out that way. Wrestlers and fans of Iowa are guests here at Rec Hall tonight. Let's give our friends from the Big Ten a big warm Penn State welcome. Our freshman year, Penn State, we, man, we had a, I, I made the right choice, um, but I wouldn't have gone wrong with with Minnesota either. Minis it was Iowa, Minnesota, and Penn State, and we all changed um, the lead for the number one spot all year long. It just kept going back and forth. Um, I injured my hand. I broke my hand early in the uh, season, so I was out. You know, I was able to get back for the Iowa duel. And they, they had my hand wrapped up. I kind of trained with it in a cast for a while, and then we put this um, soft cast on it so I could compete. And my first, um, my first match was against Bill Zadig. But I jumped ahead in the match, and um, then in the third period, I think I was up by three. And he shot a deep high crotch, and I uh, did a rolling cement mixer off that leg. Pinned him in front of 11,000 people, and that's how I started my career. It was a 
a great way to start. It was fun, it was exciting. The, the Nittany Lion ran out on the mat, you know, and uh, the place just erupted. And we were mad side, I mean, they were packed. And, um, and then the next day, I had to wrestle the guy who was ranked number one in the country. And I lost to him in sudden death. The perfectionism went right out the window in my second or third college match is what happened. So I already had my first loss. And, you know, maybe that helped me. Maybe I wouldn't have taken second without that loss. At that point, I just cut loose and I started wrestling. I realized I had, I had things to learn. You know, I had to uh, step it up to this Division I level and it wasn't high school anymore. Freshman, Kerry Kovac. So by the time we got to the NCAA tournament, um, I, I was moving well, I was wrestling well, um, you know, put myself in the finals. I was really excited. I mean, I was in the home stretch. Wrestling in the 134 pound weight class from Penn State. And then something happened, man, in, in the finals, and I just couldn't get off the bottom, and this dude rode me for two minutes. And then he just got me, man. The guy just got me, and I had I had finished a great tournament, and I wasn't nervous going to the finals, and I just lost it in midway through the, through the match. I remember after um, when I was done with that match that um, I got off the stand. And uh, I wasn't happy at all. I, could, I cared less about being second in the country. And I grabbed my plaque and I walked back and I was, there was a corner. And as I was walking, I threw the plaque into the trash can. And uh, I went over there and I was sitting in the corner and uh, by myself back in this hallway. And then comes this goofy dude with these big glasses. And he was wearing a suit that didn't fit. His tie was all crooked and it's Dave Schultz and he hands me my plaque and he sits down. And, uh, and he's like, come on, listen. He goes, this stuff doesn't mean anything anyway. He goes, look, I won one NCAA title. So I took my plaque back and he goes, I, look, I know you don't want it, but you're gonna want this someday, so take it. In my mind, I was trying to be the best in the world, regardless that John Smith had only won two NCAA titles and he was a six-time world champion, that Dave Schultz only won one NCAA title and he was a world champion. In my mind, I was saying, well, if you can't, you can't win four NCAA titles, how are you going to be the best wrestler ever? You know what I mean? So, like, I was using those things as a foundation, like, you know, the mortar in between the bricks. So when I didn't win those things, I think it was, it was chipping at me because of my, my, my perfectionism, how I wanted to be. Um, you know, once I didn't win my first year, I was like, man, this ruined my career. And when I didn't win the second one, I'm like, I got a terrible career. You know, and if, and if you ask me now, like I said, I don't want to come off and sound like unappreciative of the things I did. But when I look back at my career, you know, I did a lot of things to the people that look back and want to talk about it. And like, we're talking about it now. But when I look back, I, I look at failure, you know. And you can't change that about me. And you never will. And I don't want it to be unappreciative. But hey, I didn't do the things I wanted to do. So as far as I'm concerned, I... I came up short. When I won the NCAA title, you know, my, my team is like, man, how come you like weren't excited, you're not excited and stuff like that? I'm like, because I didn't care. I didn't like, it, you know, I, I didn't win four. I only won two. Who sits down and says, I want to win two? You know, I, I, that wasn't how I did things. But I'm not happy about it. You know, I, like I said, you saw my, my NCA plaques, I mean, you know, I mean, they just sit in a box, I don't really care. What got me to where I was at was basically saying I wanted to be the best wrestler ever to step on the mat. Um, and I think in, in, in the back of my mind back then, I, I, oh, I didn't let go of that yet. And, um, you know, so I was ready to just get it going. I just wanted to get to the Olympics, you know. I was just like in a hurry to get there as fast as I could and get to the World Championships and, and start wrestling in the, in the best tournament in the world, you know. Here's a bronze. That was um, 
in Tehran in, in 98. That was my first major overturning of a match. You could always do things better, but I, I did things right. And I, I feel like I should have at least one, one gold medal. And as I go, he pulls and I try to jump. And so that's kind of the scramble. He was in the situation that somebody else needed a favor done. That, that's what I think. And this is where you go back to, you could say that still, but you can't change a match in a back room. Not one, not two, but three matches a guy wins, there was no way they could do it. And I was, I firmly believed it. There was no way Field could be strong enough to do it. And they did. And this is where the, the, the story gets a little crazy.